Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 568. I'm trying to see if I can get myself angled to look at the camera but who the hell cares. This is episode number 568 of the Agostino Zynga show. Hope you're doing fine wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing fine. How am I? Pretty good all things considered. It's been a while isn't it? It's been a while. Um, What's my excuse for the time that I've been away not podcast recording? let's be honest here Hmm, what can i say yes the reason why i've been away has mostly or partly had to do with my allergies my allergies have really flared up the last few weeks fair enough my extracurricular activities haven't helped i'm not denying that but in general i found it very difficult to breathe on a daily basis despite that i'm still going to the gym i'm still running a bunch and i'm still trying to live a somewhat active lifestyle which is of course putting me in harm's way but then whenever I come around to recording stuff, my voice would sound mad nasally. It probably sounds nasally now, I'm not going to lie. And um, yeah, I just didn't like the way it sounded. And I just didn't want to be sniffing and coughing and, you know, belping all over the place like, you know, dark side feel or something. That's not my vibe. So I thought, you know what, let me just chill, recover and get in some sort of a better state before I come back at you. And of, of course, I went out to then correct the situation. I've been drinking loads of ginger teas, drinking loads of water. I've got, you know, uh, boxes of these flipping antihistaminic tablets, whatever they're called, coming in every other couple of weeks or whatnot. I've got an asthma pump to help me, you know what I mean? Just mad stuff, but it hasn't been the greatest. I'm not going to lie, it hasn't been the greatest. So big up all my, my, my friends out there who um have, you know, allergies and are suffering right about now. It's the best of time, especially in the UK, because the sun's out. It might not be sunny, but the sun is out. Um, So it means you can wear, you know, lighter clothing. It means you can look a bit cuter when you're going outdoors. It means people smile at you and whatnot. But if you've got allergies, it's an absolute horror show. It really is. And I have to be honest, it's been absolutely kicking my ass left to right, up to down. But though, anyway, you know what? I'm here anyway. That's what matters. That's what matters. So what's been happening in my world, in my universe? I wanted to talk about quickly. Oh, yeah, this is it. Random topic. I right? talk about random thing. I want to point out. Do any of you people out there, any of you lovely people out there in the you know, social media world, in the Internet world, out there, wherever you may be, do you unfollow people? Do you actively go through your list of people that you follow on social media, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, whether you're friending someone you're on Facebook or whatnot? Do you actually go through the list of people that are on there and think, you know what, don't talk to him anymore, boom, don't talk to her anymore, boom, don't like his content, boom, don't like this, don't don't like his feed, don't like his story, do you do that? I don't think I've ever done that in my life apart from when it's somebody that I clearly had fallen out with and i haven't fallen out with a lot of people i can count on one hand the people i've actually fallen out with or the people that i've know i've fallen out with because that's always a bit of a bad awakening and you think you're cool with somebody then you hit them up and they're like go fuck yourself you're like oops (laughs) had no idea that's always a hilarious time but for the people that i can kind of remember i don't only on one hand oh my hand was dry let's see if i put that up oh yucky Anyway, you can tell you can tell I've been I've been I've been in pain over here. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, um, from the people that I have known that I've fallen out with, maybe five I can think of that I actively went and unfollowed. Most of them, even other people who maybe have not really had much time for me, I don't really care. I honestly don't. Once I follow you, it's just kind of a it's like a dead follow. It's like a it's like a subscription on YouTube. There's channels I've subscribed on. I only realize I don't want to be subscribed to them when they pop up on my feed on my main page or something but i'm sure there's channels i've subscribed to many many years ago that have now defunct they don't upload anything on there they've moved on they've rebranded like many many of them but um i always find it a bit weird personally they're a bit lame people who go around unfollowing people i think I, I find it i kind of put it in the same category as people who um you know the kind of person because i've been spending more time on twitter anyway so i've I've noticed this over the last kind of few months that i've been on there more you know or participating on there actively you know the kind of person who um shares a screenshot of said famous person or controversial person who blocked them on social that's the same person i would go through their friend list or their follower list and unfollow someone because i don't know they didn't like their take on some political thing or they didn't like a picture they posted or they post too much or whatever i don't know what reasons people have for following on for i don't know i don't give a crap um but i find that very weird honestly because there's there's tools 
that those most social media feeds use or social media com- platforms use where you can kind of if you don't want to you know if you don't want to see someone's content you could just you know mute it you can see it less often there's little tools you can use little little little, little things here and there but for the most part it doesn't necessarily i don't think need for you to go all the way to the unfollow button now of course there are occasions when you do need to unfollow somebody right when you get into a pass with somebody or you didn't like the way somebody conducted themselves around you or you just think the person's a prick you're like nah fuck that i'm not supporting it cool i get that but in general i think unfollowing people is a little bit lame it's a little bit lame in my opinion it's a little bit lame especially if you're a dude it's a little bit cocky like going around going i don't like him anymore me, me, me. it's like grow up grow up. i mean just just stay on their follower list like the rest of us all right <laughs> maybe that's me wanting maybe that's my way of like avoiding confrontations by not unfollowing people but then again i'm not as much as i spend a lot of time on social media i'm not like um beholden to it like it doesn't run my life so i guess in that respect I don't really see follows as like that big of a deal where some people do that va- some people value their follow and they value their like and their comment a lot more than i do i don't i just like and retweet whatever i see i post whatever i like i double tap on what i like like i don't i don't really think too much about it you know what i mean it's just like a whatever and if anything i think over the last few years since i've kind of adopted that sort of you know methodology say to social media i think my discovery feed and on my discovery page on instagram and my kind of main feed on my twitter feed is just brilliant on my home feed it's brilliant it's well curated because of the things that i like the algorithm is starting to understand the stuff that i kind of i'm into it sends me crazy videos viral funny stuff crazy war videos accident stuff you know stuff that i'm into right <laughs> and i can kind of keep sharing that sort of stuff all over the, you know my timeline fashion things training things music things design social media spacex elon musk all that stuff that i'm into it was always going to kind of throw it to my feed and i think it's because i've taken an active kind of role in tapping and liking stuff um but i think if you're the person that unfollows things you're probably not doing that i'd imagine you're probably a bit careful about what you like what you don't like what you look at what you look i mean you probably got those weird things that you do but yeah i don't know let me know in the comments down below are you somebody who unfollows somebody um have you ever gone around and unliked a comment that you liked or something or deleted a comment that you left on someone's profile or whatever or reply i'd love to know because i honestly think it's one of the lamest things you can do in your life because if anything that's a real sign of a jobless person somebody that remembers who follows them number one (laughs) and then somebody who goes in their list and then unfollows that person because they're not you know i don't like you anymore i'm not your friend i don't know whatever that's that's to me that to me to me is the height is the height of joblessness but again maybe i'm in the wrong here let me know in the comments down below anyway switching topics quickly of course i wanted to recap you on my weekend gone by not weekend i think it was a couple of weeks ago wasn't it that i went oh no week and a half jesus christ we go by in a blur anyway last weekend actually on the saturday the second of april i headed to my favorite nightclub as per usual fold um over in canning town and had a barnstorming night for the toy toy music and unmute presents rado with junkie to junkie inui as i pronounce it junkie inui and christian ab and more really fun event gotta be honest and want to start off by saying when i got there actually weirdly enough this is the one time that I've been there that I didn't go on my bike because I've been going on my bike quite often. Um, it's a little bit of a mad one, I'm not going to lie. Cycling to a nightclub that you're going to go and party at, for real. You know what we mean, party. We know what we mean, and it colloquially in English terms, you know what I mean? Getting on it and whatnot. It's a bit of a mad one, cycling to a nightclub because you're going to have to cycle back. So cycling is all well and good because I didn't have a drop of alcohol, I didn't do anything. I was just so, so as a judge. Then when you're in there, and then you have to leave and it's 6 a.m in the morning or it's five or it's four or it's three or it's two you're like whoa this was a interesting choice to make so <laughs> with that being said um i would say the benefits of, of course of cycling to a nightclub is that you can get there sooner you could obviously get home sooner too it obviously you know helps you to somewhat sober up um I, 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 f- I felt like in the past when I've had a bike and I've cycled home, even sometimes when you go on festivals abroad somewhere and you get be able to rent a bike, it does sometimes wind you down. I feel like sometimes when you're out and about, you leave a club, you could be in that little bubble of like, oh, 
what's the after hours say where should we go next whereas if you just cycle home it kind of just deads the night you know what i mean the ride's already quite fun you might bang on some tunes you might stop for a bevy you might stop for a little piss you might just stop to have a seat to get some munch and then it kind of winds your night down so you just can sleep and wake up in the morning all fine and dandy but this time around i decided to you know, go there via public transport um fairly easy again for me to get there i'm honestly spoiled when it comes to fold because it's legitimately like what 20 minutes away from where i am so it's absolutely beautiful to go and i was really curious to go because number one i'm a big fan of toy toy music i'm if i'm not mistaken i must have went to one of their first ever parties it must have been around 2010 2011 back in the day in like shoreditch area i think or maybe hoxton they used to throw these parties i think it might have been like in the place this place called the peanut factory or something like that one of these old venues back in the day that people used to throw parties at and they were quite cool back then because the weird thing as well back then club scene wise techno wasn't really popping as much as it is nowadays or this hardcore hard dance sort of like thing that's going on at the moment with vtsss and uh, um who else spf djs and all those people that play that kind of music that wasn't really in back then back then it was mostly whatever was trendy what was it like deep house tech tech house minimal that sort of sound so that was mostly what people were playing in, in parties or maybe like disco and i tell her disco and stuff but toto were kind of very well known at the time for kind of really being strict about their kind of no, not even say music. No, I wouldn't say that. They were mostly minimal from what I remember. But what I also remember them as being very particular about how they put their parties together, where they host them, um, the sound system they use, um, the people they book, how to get tickets and stuff. They were always a little bit picky, always a little bit, you would say, somewhat pretentious. But it worked because usually the parties were always banging. And I hadn't been to one for years. So I think the last one I went to must have been like, I don't know, 2015 or something, right? And it's funny too, because back then, when I went, used to go like, you know, between the years of like 2010, 2015, I remember I had this idea to start this zine that I was going to make, which I probably still might end up following through on because, you know, I have to end up doing some of my projects that I end up wanting to do, but I always procrastinate on. But I was, I was going to do this zine and I think it was called like Creep or something. It was like going to be like a nightlife sort of like documentation sort of zine. And I was going to have these, I was going to have different little sections and I was going to have a section of like, you know, how to like, <laughs> how to prepare your gear, what drinks to drink, you know, deciding outfit choices or combinations. I was going to put little DJ highlights, artist profiles, club profiles, and then just like um, night reviews, right? Like, like club night reviews that are kind of, you know, noticing my, as you know kind of degradation throughout the night and i was going to feature loads of different parties and collectors because back then it was a thing of like loads of promoters were really kind of at the forefront in terms of kind of pushing the scene together and i was going to do interviews too with promoters and i think i remember i contacted i'm sure it was one of the ladies that's i think it's a lady that's the founder of it. i forgot her name anyway i think it was a lady that's a head that's a founder of toy toy to do an interview and whatnot and it didn't really kind of pan out the end because i didn't end up following through but i know i've kind of got a long association with toy toy that's what i'm going to make but anyway long story short i wanted to go to this particular event particularly to see this dude here called christian ab and the reason why i wanted to see him funnily enough and i think this is something that a lot of us kind of up-and-coming djs have to kind of get to grips with and probably a lot of managers and bookers have probably already realized i found out about this guy guess where from instagram i never knew this guy existed before instagram so on instagram i follow this account called um uh it's called like souls what's it called is it soul vibes was it? let's see if i can find it yeah let's go on instagram my number one hit is always going flipping and what's his face um Kanye west is a uh, instagram account but there's this instagram account on that I follow, right? That kind of, I think it's called like Soul Vibes. Is it Soul Vibes? Let me see if I've got it up here. Bear with me one second. Yeah, it is a Soul Vibes. So this Instagram account called Soul Vibes on Instagram. Oh, I keep saying that twice. Um, that basically um, captures loads of different clips from, m mostly from Ukraine. I think there might be some Russian ones here and there, but this is one of the main pages I was following back in the day or a few years ago or whenever it launched, whenever I saw what I'm talking about. And this is what kind of gave me the idea of wanting to go to Kiev in the first place, right? Seeing all these crazy clips of these cool club nights, you know, out on terraces and whatnot. And this Christian AB guy was somebody that was featured quite heavily. Boo. Thomas featured quite heavily on this page, right? And 
I just love the sound, especially when you hear the clips. I mean, clips are hard to kind of gather someone set wise what they're playing, but it sounded like to me when I heard Christian AB play, you no, know, his clips play on this page, it sounded like a far better version of whatever Tech House is at the moment. Yeah, whatever Seth Chocolate has turned into that at the moment, which is, you know, a shame really, because I was a, always a big fan of him, but maybe he's just, you know, too big of a person now at the moment to be anyway decent. But whatever that kind of sound was and whatever it kind of meant to me back in the day, it feels like that Christian AB guy is kind of doing it now at the moment, right? And I think, let's see if I can get a clip. I think that's a him there. No, it's not him there. That's young Marco, I think, isn't it, right? Um, there's a clip here somewhere I can find. Let's see if I can find one of him playing. But this is a page basically where I discovered him from. So I thought, you know what? I saw him playing a fold. It's near where I live. Why not go and check him out and see what he's like in real life? I think that's Radu, right? Um, is that Radu or Rarish? Let's see, that is Rarish, isn't it? Yeah. Is it Rarish? Or am I mistaken? <laughs> No, so so oh no, it's, oh no, it was like someone else. It's a resident. It's got, it's giving me a lot of um Ricardo vibes the way he's standing. But yeah, let's see if I can find a Christian AB clip. Where is it? I can't find one. He's always on here. Or am I going mad? Actually, let's see if we can get his Instagram account up. Christian AB. Oh come on. Same, yeah, I think that's him with Christian Brown. Cool. Bear with me one second. I know this is a bit of a long one, but yeah, anyway, these sort of clips are what kind of brought man to go into the festival. Sorry, going to the party in the first place, right? Um, what is this? this is a port or something? Well, I don't know what the venue's called. Um, or coming closer. So it's close to the venue in Kiev. So seeing this guy's clips, all of our social media got me interested in going to see him play. Let me see if I can get one that goes, that's not going to be too loud so you guys can hear what he sounds like. Nope, nothing there. Nothing happening here. Come on, give me one with sound, brother. Come on, come on. There we go, there's one with sound. Let's see what it sounds like. Anyway, you get the gist. So, find this guy via Instagram, which is obviously a bit of a reminder for myself to get my Instagram profile up and running or to get it a little bit better looking in terms of kind of re reflecting what I'm kind of into and what I'm kind of about in terms of DJing wise. So, you know, if ever somebody would tell you, oh, it's not important to update your socials or to be on there and posting stuff and whatever, especially as somewhat of a creative, especially when you get in that kind of mind space where you're like, oh, I don't want to show my thing. I want to keep it to myself. People will find me anyway. All that nonsense. Nah, they won't find you. I found this dude mainly through flipping Instagram. And I, f I think at the time I thought he was fucking german or berlin or something i think he's fucking english so this is even more embarrassing i had no idea this guy existed before i saw instagram anyway decided to go there and legitimately it was really fun really really fun night um big up the guys that i bumped into i got bumped into a couple of people who check out the podcast that's really cool to see a couple of people oh no actually one particular guy who said you know he kind of um wanted to come to fold based on the videos I've made or the clips I've made, you know, based on my content. So great. And thank you for that. Much appreciated. Um, and yeah, man, I really enjoyed it. I have to be honest. I think it's interesting too, because fold for the most part, if you've not been there previously, we don't know nothing about it. I would say, you know, maybe the owners wouldn't, say it but mostly you would kind of describe it as a techno club um it really is a place where you see a lot of club kids going a lot of people going out and really showing out um you know most of the music played there i would say is over 130 bpm so it doesn't necessarily cater for the house crew and if anything house in the uk is a little bit on a meh because the only really version of house you hear i think on like a weekly basis in most venues is tech house and you know for me it's i don't really mind the people that go i think people have more you know have more against the people who are into tech house than the actual music but the music is just so formulaic i mean it just doesn't go anywhere interesting um you know i know people think techno doesn't go interesting but i think tech house is even worse than that and it just is lazy you know it just doesn't do anything for me whatsoever but then when you hear someone like Christian A.B. playing and whatever that version of house he's playing, whether it's minimal, whether it's deep house, whatever it is, I don't know what it is. It's absolutely fantastic. Like he was 
he flipping had that room in the palm of his hands for the entirety of the what two and a half hours or whatever he was playing i was dancing towards the front i managed to get in at the back towards the flipping green room and be able to go where the djs were playing kind of towards the right which was nice to actually see it from that area which was quite cool um you know you get loads of weird jealous glances of people raving outside looking at you behind the booth but it's not anything to kind of shout home about I think, like I always say, I think the priority when you're going out is to always go out to dance. Don't worry about standing in front of the booth or being behind the booth or next. It doesn't matter. Go out there to dance and just show out, um, sweat a bit, listen to some good tunes, meet some cool people. The getting behind the booth thing is played out. So I stayed there for a little bit and then I kind of came back to the dance floor and stayed there for the majority of it. There was a period of time where I was legitimately dancing with the wall. It was that good. Just staring at the wall dancing because it was that much of a vibe. And I really had a great time. Um, there's going to be a clip actually played at the end of this that you're going to hear a bit of this, you know, a, a bit of the stuff that he played that I was trying to grab tune IDs from, which I found nowhere, which is always a sign of a good event. Um, no tune IDs means it's an absolute banger of an event. And yeah, man, um, sorry, banger of a DJ definitely somebody that i would say i've kind of added to my list of djs that i'll go and watch play anywhere christian ab 100 percent sure he's definitely won me over he was fucking fantastic and then radu came after i didn't stay too long for that because i had to get up early in the next day but um christian ab was absolutely fantastic at you know um at fold the only slight kind of hiccup i'd say would be maybe the crowd and again it's not really fold's fault it's not toy toy music's fault it's just what it is in the uk and when it comes to house music it's a very strange amalgamation of people you'd say you know you'd say there's a there's a lot more mandem than i've ever seen it fold number one so that's good to see it's great to kind of mix it up a little bit um but then there's a lot of lads there also so it's a weird mixture between mandem and lads listen to house music then there's a lot of people just like me who just want to listen to tunes and don't really mind and i also bumped into a couple people who just came with friends because you know it's probably the most it's probably the safest vet it's probably the safest night to go to with a couple of friends just to go to fold to check it out jeremy you know you're not going to go to some other nights um you know they're probably a little bit too larry for you just to kind of pop in with some work friends but this was i saw I, I kind of heard a few you know people that had been there who are part of birthday parties who just happened to kind of you know stumble across there or you know after work thing whatever it may be so maybe that's the vibe um but yeah the crowd was a bit strange um there were parts of it where people weren't really dancing or going for it too much but i think that's generally a house thing when it comes to house and techno crowds for the most part house people when they come into party they're dressed you know in stuff that they don't want to get dirty or don't want to fuck up um they might want to chat up girls and stuff so they don't want to look too sweaty either um whereas you know techno race people are just kind of going for it they're wearing their thickest biggest darkest clothings or boots and shit and just stomping around the place trying to get as sweaty as they can and gyrating all over as well um but yeah overall great night really recommend if you if you if you see christian ab playing in your city to give him a listen i really really enjoyed it if you're into minimal house deep house tech house whatever you know or no so if you're into that sound but you don't like tech house i really recommend you give christian ab a try or if you like tech house and you're getting bored of it and you want a bit and you want to kind of um have your wrist your faith restored in house music and you know it's beautiful history they definitely take out christian definitely check out christian ab i mean um definitely a fun event i can definitely guarantee and i can like i said in this clip you'll hear a couple of videos a couple of clips from me taken um at fold uh you know hearing the stuff and of course you can have a gander at that if you may moving on quickly from that one we're going to quickly touch upon the grammy award nominee winners uh, the grammy award um, nominees and winners funny that ain't it no one remembers the award winners anymore after the passer that went down with will smith and flipping chris rock absolute madness but hey we move um there was a weird sort of reaction to the number one album on social media because i guess most people don't listen to john what's his name john baptiste or john baptiste is that his name saying that yeah john baptiste i guess not a lot of people listen to him but his album called we are one album of the you know album of the year which you know is what it is don't really care because i don't listen to it pop duo group performance kiss me more doja cat and scissor i think that's well deserved when that track originally came out i think i had it playing on replay for like a week straight and it's the kind of tune when it kind of plays randomly in some store that you're shopping at or you're in you can't help but bop in do you know what i mean they both of their voices go together so well the hook is fantastic it's just it's such a bright and bubbly optimistic tune it's kind of it's kind of the 
if I'm if I'm gonna say this, it's it's such an anti pandemic song because it feels like for me, I don't know if you're the same. I feel like in the pandemic, music hasn't necessarily sounded great because I guess creatively, it's hard to kind of feel optimistic and joyful or whatever about the world when you know most you know half of the world is under under sort sort of lockdown. People, artists and stuff can't necessarily you know travel freely. They can't book shows they can't meet their fans or whatever right everyone's been impacted in some way and for sure for as an artist especially one that kind of you know maybe feeds off the energy and the vibes of your fan base and the, what's going on in the world in general it can be difficult i guess to kind of pick yourself up and feel inspired to create something fresh light and airy um you know that kind of just gives you good vibe sort of thing right i'd imagine so obviously you can you know make a protest song or whatnot but just creating a fun record would probably be difficult but for whatever reason they managed to do it it would kiss me more like it's just so good really really good man so i give them credit olivia rodrigo because she's flipping independent and people carrying her out I'd, i'd say new artist is fine too that album what is it butters or cups or whatever it's called what's it called the album anyway whatever the album is i enjoyed it um, I listened to it a couple of times front to back and I didn't skip one track, so I'll give her that one. Um, Record of the Year, Silk Sonic, Leader Door Open. Yeah, I would give him that. I don't think I'd say with Silk Sonic is that that album came and went. I think the album, I think the singles were, the singles sounded better when they dropped and then when you listened to them via the album, they sounded worse. It doesn't necessarily work that way, right? Usually, you hear a single you don't like it and then it sounds better when you listen to the album in sequence but for every reason it worked the opposite with them um, silk sonic and i don't know why maybe the album was too short whatever it just didn't last for me it really didn't last in my rotation at all i listened to it for about less than a week i would say and after that i kind of haven't listened to revisited ever since which is a real shame because you know Anderson Pack and flipping Bruno Mars, you know what I mean? That's a deadly, deadly duo if ever there was one. But hey, it continues. My favorite, obviously, Ward um, was definitely rap album, and I was super happy for Tyler. He definitely, definitely deserved it for Call Me If You Get Lost. Um, I still think, you know, not enough gets spoken about how good of an album that is. I'm just going through my album actually to see the track that I went to say was one of my favorites that I still play again and again and that really hit home with me in terms of the lyrics it definitely has to be um let's go down uh Wilshire Wilshire right like Wilshire is so real to me in my situation that I was going through at the time when it dropped that it legitimately made me cry like Wilshire when I first heard it from front to back like like I felt it I felt it to my bones and again usually music doesn't really have that sort of effect on me that way gospel music used to have that effect on me back in the day because that that mostly has to do because I was in church as well I mean I was under the presence of God do you know what I mean I was in the vibes but for the most part music doesn't necessarily make me cry I would say it makes me feel elated you know I feel joyful whatever but I legitimately shed a tear listening to all shit like legitimately shed a tear like it really hit home for me man those lyrics like i don't want to you know bait anyone up especially by reading it because it's going to be super obvious what i'm talking about when i read over the lyrics again but honestly there's a few bars in there maybe towards the end that oh, god damn it man tyler man he really tugged at my heartstrings so big up him for winning that um song um grammy award winning for the song was leader dot open another one there reggae album that was a funny one called soja beauty in the silence it's a all white reggae group who won it ahead of all these other you know black people that was hilarious very much in tune with the grammys but hey whatever i don't listen to reggae at all so i've got no opinion on that either way but it's just funny optically to see all these white guys you know with their white dreads winning an award for reggae album of the year <laughs> oh le jokes le jokes um latin pop album for some reason there's a whole sector of Latin pop that doesn't include, you know, reggaeton. From the listeners, I can say, yeah, unless these guys do do reggaeton, I don't know. But that's interesting, observation-wise. Um, pop solo performance, Oliver Rodrigo, Driving License, I don't really know. Rap Song of the Year, Jail, interesting that. Um, really interesting that. Um, because there's a version of this without, there's a version of this with, um, what's his face, right? With uh, with um, the baby. Did he get a record too or not? personally i would have given it to family ties on my life personally weird songs in there anyways many more songs i would have added on there 
But if it was me, I would have even given it to a stretch. I'd say, let's go for family ties. I think family ties would definitely get it for me, just in terms of how you know how that that track was kind of constructed, the places it goes, what it sounds like. The fact that for me it, it kind of reintroduced Baby Keem, like he's 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 a far more well-rounded rapper than he was when he first popped out. I think um, he's definitely you know he's definitely kind of um, gained from maybe the prolonged time that he kind of spent on the sidelines or away from the kind of limelight, kind of honing his craft. So that was good. Music video Freedom, I don't know, know about that one. Melodic Hurricane, nice. Uh, music album, pop album, but yeah, you get the drift in it. Anyway, so quickly wanted to touch on. Tyler the Creator's speech because I thought it was pretty cool. Um, he obviously accepted his Grammy in the most Tyler the Creator way ever by taking a hike somewhere with his friend. I think it's Taco there, but here with him. They were riding bikes with his flipping um, what was it? What's that? What's that car called? I'm not really a big car guy. I don't know. Was it a Rolls Royce truck in the background there? Um, that he pulled up on with these flipping um 26 inch bmx's or whatnot 29 inch bmx's riding bikes and he decided to jump on instagram live and accept his grammy award in the middle of some hike somewhere pretty cool i didn't go i didn't go to the grammy so i was gonna do a thank you on do my speech on here oh shit nigga the cheesecake factory in here y'all nigga almost failed Yes, nigga. Oh, nigga, nigga. All right. Um, I'm doing. I'm not at the Grammys. I don't know where I am. <laughs> doing what I do best. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, first off, I'm hyped. Thank you to DJ Drama. You are fucking so important to rap music. Grills, thank you to all of my friends for being my cheerleaders. Thank you to my whole team, the whole squad. Vic, Neil, thank you. To where I could just make a album where I just flex all goddamn day. Uh, uh, inspired helping rap off this fucking album and getting it done. Um, and thank you to Justin picked it up again. And I know you're seething and angry and uh, no one listens to that album. These arena tours that are selling out says different. And if you put that much energy into something maybe everyone will be proud of you too who's he talking about there is he talking about dj Khaled still that's an interesting kind of long lasting beef that's been brewing in it it'd be awesome though also to see going forward if they somehow end up working together imagine tyler was able to bring out the best in dj Khaled. like he actually got a number one album or he actually got an, a grammy award-winning album or an album that sold you know half a thousand that he wants to sell or no, that was critically acclaimed because that's the one thing you get from DJ Khaled. He seems like somebody, despite his success, he's still chasing critical acclaim, but he doesn't make music that would interest critics in it. It's all kind of formulaic and boring and one note and forgetful and kind of it kind of comes and goes, isn't it? All of it. Like you think of even um you think of what's that track with Rihanna and what's his name? And that guy, uh you know what I'm talking about, right? With a dun that kind of salsa tune right whatever that tune is called that tune was everywhere for whenever whenever it dropped and then as soon as it dropped within a week it kind of died and i know it because at the time it dropped i remember i was djing that weekend i think it might have dropped let's say on a friday and i was maybe djing the following weekend by the time the following weekend came out it sounded dated it legitimately sounded dated it legitimately got like a bit of a groan you know some sort of reaction here and there but no one really reacted to it the way i thought they react to it which led me to believe which led me to kind of come to the conclusion of like oh shit DJ Khaled's music doesn't age well at all. Like it's very microwavable sort of music. But I would be interested to see Tyler work with DJ Khaled in the future. I think that'd be pretty cool. Love to everyone. And uh yeah, the sun is fucking beaming, bitch. Call me if you get lost. Definitely not finished. And uh 12 years in, got a second one. Didn't expect it, so 
Let's see what the fuck is next. I do not know what the fuck I'm going to do, but figuring that out. Thank y'all. Big love. How is that not inspiring, right? How is that not inspiring as a kid? That's the thing I must, that's the thing I've got to give people this credit for, right, in general, for kind of documenting this sort of stuff, right? Having your flipping truck at the back there with your bikes and your best friend hanging out, living your best life, like kids out nowadays looking at that must think you know what I'm, whatever way i'm gonna do it it doesn't matter if you're gonna do it winning a grammy it doesn't matter if you're gonna do it opening a big cake shop or whatnot like it's cool to see this stuff in real time to see people that look like you dress like you into the same stuff like you the same stuff that you're into if you care about the race or stuff you know people that are actually from the same place that you're from all that stuff blah 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 it's super super important and um that's maybe why sometimes these awards it's, it's weird to say this right but that's what sometimes i think these awards they don't necessarily need to be even given to somebody based mostly on their musical talent or whatever you know that album brought to have a much joy that album brought to people in that given year sometimes it can just be given to somebody because of the outsized influence they've had on culture in that period of whatever they kind of judge albums from that can cut that's just sometimes kind of go into it that's why sometimes that's why i look back at the time that macklemore won that grammy ahead of kendrick where it's like that was a missed moment you know i mean you'd never know who you never know the sort of again if you if you didn't chase your dreams because kendrick didn't win an album then you probably were never going to chase your dreams anyway but i just think in terms of kind of encapsulating a moment and putting like a full stop on it and kind of saying hey this is what happened in that era giving someone like Kendrick an album at that time would have just been so cool for the scene, for the genre, um, for the world, for kids, whatever coming up for everything. I mean, it would have really set an interesting precedent going forward because I think now, you know, I'm, I'm always a big believer in, you know, or I'm, or I'm always kind of optimistic that the future is going to be incredible. But I generally think like, imagine, right. I was obsessed with Pharrell when I was growing up, obsessed especially with his music more so the fashion i didn't really care about because i was wearing that stuff when i was growing up right? i was wearing bape and bbc and if, if anything back then some of us even saw pharrell as a poser if that's if that makes any sense back then back in the day my generation of guys thought pharrell was a poser mostly for the skateboarding stuff but you know sometimes it was all for the fashion and how nigo was kind of you know basically um you know couldn't kind of let let him go right as soon as he found pharrell stumbled across him like he was kind of that was his guy and most people kind of looked at him like a bit of a lame but if pharrell was able to inspire somebody of a talent like like if pharrell was able to inspire somebody like a tyler to come out and create what he's created just imagine what tyler's gonna be able to influence going forward in the next 10 20 30 years what the next generation is going to look like what that music is going to sound like it's going to be incredible to see i really can't wait to see what that looks like like the next tyler sort of like protege or whether it's a group or a female or whatever it's going to be so cool to see it really really is going to be cool to see but yeah congrats to tyler call me if you get lost of course like i said album of the year for me as soon as i heard it it was like album of the year like number one like there's no other contender for me i played it many many times will sure it's for sure one of my favorite tracks on there maybe second to massa maybe second massa comes here maybe run it up um and rise i'd say they're probably one of two of my favorites or my favorites on the album itself but yeah big up tyler um that award was much much deserved i think moving on quickly I want to touch on some football news it's been sort of confirmed through multiple sources that Eric Ten Hag is due to be the next manager of Manchester United and this is an article courtesy of ESPN that kind of covers it featuring the ever dour Mark Ogden um, here as the headpiece but yeah man it looks like the guy that we've all been kind of pining for in the United fan base is actually going to get the job it looks like for once you know the united hierarchy are going to do the right thing and actually hire the guy that we actually want as opposed to hiring the guy that they want um too late basically because it feels like every managerial appointment we've had from david moyes i felt like has come too late or come too soon right um you know when 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 Sarah ferguson went the perfect person to get after as ferguson would have been Mourinho. we don't we get moyes then we get Moyes, we don't give him the help or the support he needs and then he kind of flops and then we get who van gal then we get Mourinho. Then we get. I mean, it was always too late. I felt like Mourinho. You're getting him. You know, um, you're getting him kind of 
a few years past his kind of peak powers van gal you're getting him a bit on the wane and also a manager who needs to have an infrastructure around him to be successful it didn't work out Ole Gunnar Solskjaer comes and you think he can just vibes it and kind of you know do the whole kind of united dna in malarkey and that obviously didn't work because you can't dna your way into winning a title or challenging for the champions league it's just not gonna happen the competition is just too fierce so now it feels like weirdly enough it, yeah now it kind of feels like we've been backed into a corner united are so shit now that there's no other option but to fix it because what you tried before isn't gonna work especially considering how well considering how much other teams around us have improved and considering the fact that every other team in the world with the exception of maybe a few has the same structure that we're trying to implement you know in terms of having a director of football having a way you want to play having a recruitment process that's you know watertight having us you know and then having the way you play inform the, the the managers you hire and the players that you sign are just basic stuff and we've never had that so because we've been such an abject failure for the past nine years or whatnot right since the glazers have been in charge um or since the glazers have kind of taken full charge of the club since sex works retired it feels like we've been backed into a corner and it feels like finally hallelujah they've listened to reason and they've kind of decided to hire a manager and put an infrastructure around him that i feel like should steer us in the right direction Am I under the delusion that Eric Ten Hag is going to come in and have us winning the champion? Sorry, challenging for the league or winning the Champions League anytime soon? No, I think any United fan that thinks that is delusional. What most United fans, I feel like, want to see is just a team that plays like a team, a team that goes out there and you know bleeds for each other, that runs for each other, that plays entertaining football, that puts on a bit of a show. Youngsters coming up, like I don't know, whatever it may be, that's all we want to see as a as a as a club because we've been devoid of that for so long. The football's been so bad for so long, with the brief exception of some periods where Oli was in charge, some periods where Van Gaal was in charge. Each man just had their their spell where they played good football, but largely it's been diabolical dire you know pull your eyes out with by a spoon type of um football so hopefully Eric ten Hag does that and i think because ten Hag comes from ix and he comes from a system where you know a lot of he comes from a system where basically there's a lot of things that have to be put in place in and around him to make him successful and he's also the supreme boss i think him coming in is going to hopefully push us into changing the way that we kind of support managers in the same way I feel like Ronaldo, when he signed for the club, he basically exposed how badly one we are as a football club. Yes, he might not be in the success on the pitch that we all hoped, but there's no denying Ronaldo's influence has definitely affected the way that we've kind of seen the season, the way we've kind of been wanting, demanding more from the club. And now we're in a position where we're finally going to get our guy. And I'm hoping, fingers crossed, hoping that United board do the right thing and follow through, not only with the managerial hire, but also with the people in and around him. Because that, I feel like, is the most important part of this process. Not only hiring the manager, but also getting him the right coaches, the right supporting staff to allow him to be as successful as he can um, at the club. But anyway, the article says as follows. Main and I said to finalize the appointment of manager so appointment of Eric Ten Hag as a club's next manager Ten Hag 52 who's interviewed by United last month had been on the four-man shortlist alongside Paris Saint-Germain's Moshe Pochettino Spain's Luis Enrique Seville's Julian Lopetegui and Chelsea's Tuchel and by Munich Julian Lopetegui were ruled out as being unattainable sources in England and the Netherlands have told ESPN that United have settled on Ten Hag as a new manager and that the Ajax manager is ready to leave Dutch champions and takes charge of all traffic in the season it's crazy right that he's I said this before in the Twitter space, but I definitely agree. I would think, again, yes, we are a historic club. We've won loads of trophies in the past, blah, 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 blah. But it could be argued that coming to United, especially considering the state they were in, with the players that we've got, the entitlement, the weird fan base, like, it legitimately is a step down. Legit. He's leaving Dutch champions. He's in a really tight... Um, two team title race at the moment now i think you know with, with psv um you know they play in the champions league every season for the most part and he's coming to united when you know most likely we're going to be out of the champions league we're not going to be challenging for the league anytime soon and we're probably going to get knocked out of the domestic cups pretty soon because we do that often as well so it's definitely i feel like 
not the easiest job to take if you're Eric Ten Hag, but it does maybe prove his ambition because he knows if he's able to come in and be moderately successful, right? Imagine if he wins a trophy in his first season, how much gas, how gassed the fan base will be, right? How much his reputation will be bolstered. Yes, I don't accept, expect it or believe it will happen, but if that did happen, so it definitely is a calculated, it's definitely is a big risk, big step down, but also a calculated risk, I feel like. It says here, United's pursuit of the new manager has been led by the football director, John Murto, and technical director, Darren Fletcher. So I guess Darren Fletcher finally pulled himself away from the flipping training pitch and decided to go and actually do his job, which is great to see. I hope this continues for the long term. I hope we don't see Darren Fletcher on the flipping bench with the managers again anymore. I've had enough of that. Let's have the actual experts or in their field or the people that need to do their job doing their jobs, right? No more job for the boys, no more Mike Feelings, no more all these donuts out there. Just get them all out, clean, clean sweep. Let the manager come in with his own people. If it doesn't work out, let the next guy come in with his own people. Just keep on going, like keep on going that way, like every other big club does. I don't understand this idea that we have where we bring in all these you know i don't know let's just continue who have reported to chief executive richard arnold with joint chairman joe glazer having a final decision appointment that i don't like that's the thing i don't like because this is a big i feel like red flag richard arnold still is the basically the guy that's in charge he's effectively ed woodward replaced you know this is basically ed woodward so john Murto and thing have to report to him to get signed off and then he passes it on to joe glazer to get signed off to get final final sign off when really it should be football people doing the entire thing there should be no richard arnold there should be no joe glazer it should be whoever's on top of these guys because i still think job moto isn't necessarily the standout candidate to be a director of football of man united he's got you know his experience or his cv isn't as extensive as other directors of football out there darren fletcher as a technical director i guess other people have said most big clubs have an ex-pro um sort of in that kind of role as a sort of like club liaison ambassador type person who can maybe speak to young players who maybe want to join the club or the club is trying to trying to sign blah 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 but for sure if you're going to keep these guys then i would assume it would be, it would be beneficial to get that's why maybe we're, we're doing the whole um, what's his face ragnick role in it maybe that's why ragnick is deciding to do the consultancy for two years to help these two out um, but in general, it should be John Murto, Darren Fletcher, and Ragnick. And these guys should be nowhere near Richard Allen and John Luke should be nowhere near the direction of decision making of football. What they should be doing is signing off the checks. That's it. They should be, you know, approving the wire transfers and whatnot, but they should be nowhere near the direction of football. So that's the only red flag I have. It continues. While some. At United consider the PSG boss Pochettino. Sources told ESPN Arnold and Glazers are in agreement that Ten Hag is the best candidate to replace interim manager of Ragnick, who's been in charge since December. Choice of the Oligan social successor ultimately came down to a straight battle between Ten Hag and Pochettino, but the difficulties experienced by Pochettino at the PSG this season combined with the potential cost of releasing him from his remaining 12 months of his contract at the Parc des Princes left the former Tottenham manager behind Ten Hag for both football and financial reasons. The interesting thing about Pochettino, I feel like, is like, Obviously, his reputation has somewhat been damaged during his time at PSG. No one can deny that. I also feel like he definitely needs another job after the PSG job to kind of recover, you know, repair his reputation because I still think he's a good manager. But, you know, some people out there have said, oh, his time has been and gone. He's kind of on the downward trajectory. I don't necessarily believe that. I feel like the same thing happened at Thomas Tuchel can happen to Pochettino right just needs one good job after PSG to kind of remind people that good of a manager is because I feel like the PSG job is as toxic or the PSG club and the, you know the players there are as toxic as ours are especially in terms of entitlement and they've probably not won as much as them at all um but the other thing I find interesting is that I think it was in January there was a story that came out I think Dunga Castle was saying where I think it was the time where Pochettino appeared on Sky News and he was basically it looked like trying to you know do that whole come and get me plea thing with the English clubs because he wasn't enjoying his time at PSG. He went to leave, and then PSG got whiff of that, and they basically, you know, put him in the basically told him in un, no uncertain terms, you're not going anywhere. So you're going to be the manager. You're going to ride this out with us. So he was basically forced to stay in some roundabout way, and it feels like they've gone out of their way to not sack him, even though they know United need a manager because they knew he would immediately get another job right they've kind of put him in this sort of misery box it feels like because they're out of the champions league um 
they're going to be, you know, they're, they're way behind, I think, in League 1 too. No, or they're not. Actually, they're way ahead, actually, in League 1. I'm pretty sure they're way ahead in League 1, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but obviously, the Champions League is a big thing over there because, you know, the league is kind of a bit of a misnomer because they got the most money. So he's in a weird position. He kind of would have never got the job anyway because the Glazers wouldn't want to pay his compensation fee or his get-out-of-contract fee. And he's now in a position where he has to kind of stay and probably what take a job or maybe sit on the sidelines for a bit because there won't be enough jobs out available when he does end up becoming available maybe Everton because Lampard probably not getting sacked who knows but she had 50 initially being like his favorite candidate to replace Solskjaer who was fired by United a month short of his third anniversary manager too late I feel like the club are aware that Pochettino would be um, open to a move or Trafford after struggling to impose himself at a job at PSG a PSG Champions League exit at the round of 16 against Real Madrid having led 2-0 in the tie did not help his cause with the United job PSG's readiness to hold out for 15 million compensation package was another issue for United who are able to appoint Ten Hag if they put if they pay just 1.7 million so clearly just a money thing in it with our club you gotta love United um, sources added that Rene Mollestein glad to see that first team coach on the Sirius Ferguson from 2007 to 2013 is one candidate being considered as Ten Hag's assistant the recruitment department at the club has also been told to find a shortlist of players in his position and present to the new manager though he'll also be allowed to present new targets that's pretty cool and there's also talk about you know Van Persie being his assistant too coming in I'm glad whoever he wants to bring in let him bring in clean sweep let's start again from scratch I'm happy to see us going in the right direction and hopefully this kind of spells the beginning of some new interesting things at United Fingers crossed, it. Fingers crossed. In other news, courtesy of Pitchfork, the weekend is replacing Kanye because Kanye decided out of the blue to drop out of Coachella 2022, like a couple of weeks, you know, out of the festival happening. Is it a couple of weeks or maybe two weeks or maybe a week and a half? I don't know. Yeah, April 17th to 24th. So a couple of weeks out, Kanye West decides to completely drop out of the festival. No one knows why. Um, it's funny or interesting because it felt like this was a f appearance that Kanye was really looking forward to. You know, his Coachella performances are always really eye capturing. Um, he was posting, if I remember, illustrations or sketches of set designs and whatnot. And you would have assumed, considering the year he's had, um, that he was going to go out with a bit of a bang. And there was obviously rumours that he was going to bring out Travis, Travis Scott, during his performance too. Because obviously, you know, Kanye is very much anti counterculture and he wanted to stand up for his friend or his brother-in-law. Um, in terms, is it brother-in-law? I don't know, whatever you call him, right friend, when it comes to the cancellations that's happening with Travis Scott with the whole um, Asher War tragedy. And I don't know, it just seemed like a big deal to him. So it's very surprising to see him drop out, but also not surprising because it's Kanye. Then Coachella have to go and kind of, you know, scan, scan the world and see who can replace or who's going to be an adequate replacement for Kanye. And at the time I felt like, I, thought, I forgot, who did I say? I think I mentioned, who did I mention? <laughs> I think I mentioned someone like Nicki Minaj or something, I think at the time. But maybe she doesn't have enough, you know, new material out at the moment to make that worthwhile. It's a bit too short notice too for her. Maybe she didn't want to leave her kid. I don't know, whatever. Um, but then when they got announced that it was the weekend in Swedish House Mafia, that made a lot more sense. Um, especially when you consider the weekend is gearing up for a massive world tour, like it's crazy amount of dates he's doing. Twitch House Mafia, of course, you know, they're always playing. They've produced a couple of tracks, I think, on a new album, I'm pretty sure. A couple of that, I was surprised they did produce because it didn't really sound Swedish House Mafia-ish. It wasn't very EDM-ish, whatever, but I would assume they probably got bangers and tracks that I have no idea that they've done for days that's going to be really entertaining as a kind of show that they put on because I'm sure that's going to be a key part of the actual performance. So it's just going to be the weekend performing. It'll be them kind of performing on tandem. And if, again, it's just a perfect replacement i feel like um especially considering how good you know that uh, flipping dawn fm album is like it's gonna be a banger it's definitely gonna be a banger i'm really really looking forward to watching the stream on youtube like the rest of us are i really am looking forward to i'm not gonna lie to you but then the funny story off the back of that <coughs> is this plant story that it feels like Coachella put out to kind of put pressure on The weekend. It says as follows. This is courtesy of page six. The weekend demands Kanye West 8.5 million Coachella paycheck threatens a pull out. To me, this feels like Coachella have purposely put this out there in an effort to kind of back The weekend into a corner so that he accepts whatever offer they've given him. 
But I also don't understand why they don't just pay up. Kanye dropped out with two weeks notice. Maybe they've served him with a penalty fee. Who knows? He doesn't care. He'll pay off. He's a billionaire. It doesn't matter. But he dropped out at two weeks notice. It's pretty difficult to get somebody who's ready to perform on that stage, given, you know, the legends and the flipping, you know, iconic performances that have come before them um, and perform to a level required. And to also make it worthwhile for the guests that are appearing there or for the customers, blah, blah. So you find one in the weekend, ready-made, who's gearing up already for a world tour. He's probably got a set already already done, routine set out, set this already fine-tuned. He's ready to go. He's plug and play, basically. That's a perfect thing. If anything, he should be getting a bit more than that to basically thank him for the fact that he's doing it. But it, they look at their omen and iron over the 8.5 million. It's like, no, nah, that, that's... The, 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 basically, you know, no one could maybe... It could be argued that Kanye should maybe make more an appearance fee than the weekend. Fair enough. But given the circumstances, part of the 8.5 million is going to be the late fee, right? The fact that you made me last minute, you have to pay this. Uh, it just is what it is. Um, they continue. But this could maybe just show you how slimy the music industry is, isn't it? Where they're just putting out this flipping news in the effort to kind of get him to... Um, to acquiesce because everyone's going to be online oh my god it's 8.5 million how could he know if i had that money i would perform for 1 million you know that kind of stuff like crazy anyway it says as follows curse your page six the drama coachella continues to play out coachella organizers leisurely try to stiff the weekend after he stepped in to replace the kanye west on sunday's headliner at the festival we're told the singer threatened to pull out if he wasn't paid the same money as west who was set to rake in 8 million plus 500 production fee Page Six has exclusively revealed that the weekend was the front runner to replace All the Lights rapper who bailed on the gig less than two weeks before the show. Um, Coachella organizers announced early Wednesday that the weekend 32 and house music supergroup Studio Taft Mafia will be taking over rapper's slot on April 17th, April 24th. Bruv, to get 8.5 million for two dates and a production fee. So the, that fee is, oh, yeah, boss. But a music source told us that the deal wasn't yet done for the Blinding Light singer. The source said the weekend came in at short notice to take Kanye's spot, but Phil Antwitz, who owns the Coachella Festival through AAG, wanted to hold on to Kanye's money and pay the weekend far less than just a few million. Oh my god, so he went to pay him what, like two million? Come on, man. Piss take. The festival would pocket the rest. Um, cause I, you know what this makes me think? Pocket the rest, cool. Uh, that might be the reason but it also makes me think that maybe they haven't sold as many tickets as they're letting out or they're letting on or maybe it costs way more to produce coachella and they may be in the red and that that extra few mil is going to allow them to basically you know uh break even or something because it doesn't make any sense like why would you somebody of the caliber of the weekend you should be paying him exactly what kanye was going to get paid merely for the inconvenience or merely because he's, you know, he's basically making it inconvenient for you. Or alleviating of the inconvenience, uh, let's say. Um, the ploy led to a fraught negotiations this week with the weekend's management and Auschwitz company Golden Voice, which produced the festival. The source continued. Even after Coachella announced a new lineup on Wednesday, a deal wasn't in place for the weekend, who threatened to pull out at an hour's notice if he didn't get the same deal as Kanye. Finally, on Wednesday, faced with the prospect of um, second headliner pulling out the Coachella, Auschwitz company caved and agreed to pay the weekend the same money. Good. While reps of Auschwitz didn't comment, a second insider said the billionaire AG mogul wasn't personally handling the negotiations, which were handed by an employee. Of course, he's going to, you know, throw the employee under the bus. Um, a rep for Weekend didn't record and turn multiple calls for comment and West rep didn't respond. Earlier this week, Page Six exclusively reported that West bailed on the gig less than two weeks before showtime because he wants to get help after publicly dragging former wife, which wasn't true because I guess Jason Lee came out and said it's not true, um, which led to a 24-hour Instagram suspension, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, crazy, isn't it, right? Like, imagine, imagine the gall on somebody to, you know, to try and book you lastminute.com and then say, hey, we're not going to pay you the same money as a previous person. But I guess this happens a lot in freelance work too, right? People like last minute fill in to do a job, to spec something out. They then don't pay you or they pay you late or they try and pay you less what they paid the other person, which is, I think, is why in life, in general, I wish we're not going to be in that position ever, I think, as a society, just because we're just not geared that way. But I, I really do wish we were more open with how much we get paid in jobs and stuff with our friends and our colleagues 
and our peers were more open about you know what this what this role pays i don't know marketing manager seo person creative director project manager whatever it may be right especially in different sort of maybe sectors i think it'd be really important because what it will allow you to do when it comes to negotiating your contract especially you go you know signed to you know you go you go get a new job somewhere else it allows you to be in a position where you don't need to undercut yourself and usually when it comes to money that realization honestly i, I think most people have had it that realization when you figure out somebody that's maybe working the same role as you or maybe doing less than you is earning triple what you're earning it can hurt you so much like really really hurt you so if you're able to kind of get an understanding of what the climate is and what everyone's on it can allow you to negotiate for higher pay or it can allow you to know what to basically demand when you walk in the door in the first place um but yeah this is real real cunty shit man so yeah big up the weekend for holding out and getting his bag and hopefully that performance goes off without a hitch i cannot wait i cannot wait moving on to things that i can wait for and i'm not gonna wait for and i don't care for i just wanted to highlight because why not why bloody not it looks like palace are collaborating with calvin klein on a ck1 capsule collection that i feel like is giving me mad yawn vibes and is if anything a another reminder of just how meh palace is as a brand and also how much irrelevance calvin klein has in the current discourse at the moment like they do nothing of any relevance it looks like they're jumping from designer to brand to brand in order to kind of revive a moment and i think as somebody pointed out on twitter the other day sometimes bowing out gracefully and just saying you know we've run our course we've done well like kind of dken why or whatever else other brands out there that did the same sort of thing sometimes just kind of hanging it up and going about things differently or maybe you know deciding to license it somewhere else whatever it may be is the right way to go about things trying to constantly revive it isn't going to work because if anything i would argue that calvin klein hair and presser collection was pretty decent i didn't mind it to be honest i thought the imagery and the visuals and the story behind it was really cool especially considering hair and Preston is a new yorker somebody's very kind of tied to that scene um doing what he's doing with his brand it, it, there was a lot of synergy i felt like between what he was doing at hair and Preston, what he's doing at and the work obviously he did with Calvin Klein. If anything, just announcing him as the de facto creative director going forward would have been a pretty good move. He would have kept that thing chugging along. He would have made a couple of good pairs of jeans, some nice t shirts, some hoodies, some great outerwear pieces. Like it would have been a pretty decent, I feel like, ongoing relationship between them. But for every reason, I feel like they kind of changed and they're all they've gone under this idea that they're going to have different people doing their different takes on what CK is and what Calvin is and obviously still running the brand as is at the moment. But this probably just causes more confusion. You can buy mainline Calvin Klein. You can buy this collaboration stuff, Calvin Klein. You can buy the Calvin Klein that you found in TK Maxx. Like, there's just too many product lines, too many brands at the same time and none of it makes sense like why are they collaborating with palace why this is a this is a straight clout chase isn't it this is not there's no story tying this together there's nothing that makes sense with it like well what what you're telling me those skaters wear calvin klein boxes i've seen some of these guys out and about they don't they won't wear calvin klein boxes i can guarantee you that do you know what i mean there's nothing that ties these together at all zero if anything they might have been wearing ben sherman boxes right maybe but not Calvin Klein boxes. It just doesn't make any sense. But again, when you want to try and revive a brand, I guess you have to do things that are somewhat unconventional or that don't make sense in an effort to kind of grab people's attention because it's grabbed my attention and then use that attention to maybe then, you know, get your brand back up where it should be. But in my opinion, this is beyond life support. This is just like dead, like dead. There are zero vibes on this have nothing interesting if anything this is stuff that's going to be immediately immediately copied on aliexpress like just you know just meh like zero but maybe it's most to do because of my feelings with palace maybe it's to do with that because i hate the brand and everyone around it like maybe that's why but i honestly don't feel like this has does add anything to whatever conversation is going on out there nothing at a stretch you might say the underwear is cool maybe the jeans but Again, why not just wear regular Calvin Klein's? Like, why? What's the? They've got what Calvin Klein's and Vans. I just, I just don't get it. I really don't. I think it's a, I think it's a bit of a wasted opportunity. 
again like i said maybe it's just a reminder that the brand maybe should just you know accept its fate and just decide to kind of bow out gracefully you know maybe give it to someone else to kind of run and just you know stop chasing the moment it's not going to happen again it's just it's what it is it's over it's done it's done for uh, the sooner they realize that the better probably but yeah let's see what people in the comments of hb4 about it the car the jacket was pretty decent i guess but let's see what the comments feel about it fire everyone involved in this atrocity <laughs> ralph loren and palace over like calvin Klein's and palace again like even the collaborations they do in it ralph loren to calvin Klein's like okay that aunt can get it though i think these are the all what these I think those authentics are not slip ones. Okay, cool. I'd buy the CK jean price. I think the reason why they make these collabs nowadays is just PR and they don't even care about selling products because 99% is just horrible, lazy, useless stuff which nobody would wear, but everyone's hyped about those ads and photo shoes. So I think it's the wrong one. That's true. And I also think to myself, like, obviously it's going to sell out, right? Either, either they're going to lie and say it's sold out by fobbing the numbers or they're just going to make a really small amount of it so it's going to just sell out because they've only made like a hundred per you know per piece or whatnot i don't know whatever it's going to sell out one or the other cool it does sell out but who's wearing this and if it doesn't sell out where does all this shit go because this isn't like this isn't nothing timeless about it. yes it's, it's a mild gray jumper it's a classic denim jacket and jeans it's a pair of boxes it's a vest top it's a t-shirt i get it but it's not nothing that people need. There's nothing, there's no step, no step. There's nothing like timeless about this collection. I, I, you know, two weeks later, this is going to be old news. What's purpose is it serving? And I guess maybe that what that commenter said is right. Like maybe this is just a one, maybe that's what collabs are nowadays. Collabs are just one big marketing opportunity in the same way that, in the same way that you would say, weird weird kind of analogy but in the same way like a comedy special if you're a stand-up comedian nowadays i'd imagine especially if you're a big one you most likely have a podcast right or some sort of vlog on youtube or something where you communicate with your fans on a kind of consistent basis somewhat you probably earn adsense off of that you probably get sponsors or ads or placements whatever right maybe you do that on your instagram too so if you look at that most likely you probably make more money on the podcast than you do actually doing stand-up comedy. So in theory, when you do a stand-up special and you record it in an auditorium and you, you know, you have people come in and you re- it looks amazing and it's on Netflix or Showtime or YouTube or Comedy Central, whatever it may be, that's more so a kind of living, breathing business card to kind of show who you are as a comedian so that people can come and check you out on your podcast ultimately or maybe book you for more gigs but you're not actually making the much money on the actual stand-up yes you might get an advance from netflix like you know like a dave Chappelle does like you know those millions that he gets to produce the specials but most of those the point of those specials is that it kind of allows you to be everlasting so that people can always have a reference of like what your materials like and anytime you're in a city they're gonna buy a ticket for you to come and see you play or they're gonna support your merch or they're gonna check out your show or they're gonna check out your podcast whatever it may be and maybe this is what they do with these brand collaborations they use them as an opportunity to kind of bring more eyes to the brand so if you're Calvin Klein and you're flipping ice cold you want to get those hype beast kids who buy Palace to pay attention to your brand so you hope by aligning yourself with the cool guys that the kids are gonna come out and they're gonna be like oh shit i want to i want to wear calvin klein i forgot about that brand and they might start buying it after they buy your calvin klein palace stuff maybe but i don't think it works that way personally you're gonna get a bunch of resellers buying this stuff to flip you're gonna get a bunch of hype kids or hype beasts buying it because they're just fans of the brand and whatever it's got a trifeg logo on it they'll cop and then you're gonna get people who generally like it buying it but the resellers are a big chunk of it and they're gonna dead the market you know what i mean and then it's gonna be what i don't know i just think it's a bit dead personally for me i don't necessarily get it i don't vibe with it um i'm happy for unknown tito he's starring in some of the editorial picks here it looks like um da, 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 da. so he looks fucking great in it so big up unknown t but there's zero vibes to this there was a time in my life when i might have seen this and thought oh yeah this looks really cool but seeing william defoe in some cool clothes surrounded by some skaters it's like i don't give a shit really don't care 
none of this looks cool to me. I know T looks cool, or whatever it may be, but I don't know. I know T will sell more hoodies for me than this, than these. I think that's like Max Powers. Max Power, Max Powers, sorry, that's the name, right? I'm not see him in a minute, but that's probably good to see him still in the team. Don't get me wrong, but it's like, I, don't, I just don't care. I really don't. It does absolutely nothing to me. Zero. This is like what? This is like what some guy in flipping um, Labrador Girl would be wearing, isn't it? Some dude that listens to Scar, you know? Some guy that's got stories about how Notting Hill used to be. He's going to be wearing this sort of outfit. Like, I, I just I just don't know. Like, really? I don't know. I don't care. None of it makes sense. It's all fucking shit. Um, but yeah, maybe I'm in the minority here. Maybe I'm in the minority. And if you do like it, please let me know in the comments down below if you like it and you bought a pair. Um, imagine going out looking at this. Like, Jesus Christ, man. Like, come on, geezer, man. This is fucking shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna lie this is so shit it's just like a waste of fabric isn't it like where's this stuff go if it doesn't sell where'd it go where, do, where does this stuff go does this get sent to ukraine like what happens to this stuff or does it just get used as canvases or something i don't know i'm cu i'm generally generally curious of course my man wearing you know loafers with jean shorts of course um but yeah i don't know man I don't know. I don't know. Hey, you gotta do, you gotta do, and you gotta do, you gotta do. So, big up anyone that wears it. Congratulations to you. Um, moving on, we have a closer look at these fantastic and pretty much crazy looking converses, courtesy of a Cold War. I legitimately, legitimately was shocked and surprised when I found out these were converses because I think a while back. Sammy Ross must have uploaded a um, Instagram story of him. I think it might have been when he was maybe uh, designing these actually, right? A couple of concepts here and there, blah, blah, blah. I think something, some mock-ups, whatever he did. And there was never a tag of who it was. And I just assumed he was working with Nike. I never really in my head thought it would be Converse. And then out of the blue, they, you know, they, they released and he's sending them out to his friends and whatever. And it's Converse tag. And I was like, these are fucking Converse's. They look fucking sick, bruv. Um, so it's a Cold War and Converse Ion Active CX. Now, I'm curious to know if this is an actual inline model um, from Converse that they're, they kind of made and then they asked him to design a colorway or if this is something that he has designed from the ground up with the Converse design team. Either way, it's fucking sick. Like, it's a really... This is what I kind of think Reebok should have done. That's the thing I wonder. I wonder why have Reebok not been able to kind of move away from the Reebok Classic? Because I remember I saw like an advert of fucking Getz um, advertising Reebok Classic. I was like, Getz, come on, brother, man. You, you're from, you're, we're from the same area. I never saw you wear Reebok Classics, fam. Like, come on. Like, anyway, get, get your bag. But he's kind of promoting Adidas, sorry, promoting Reebok Classics. And it was like, it seems like Reebok can't, get anyone to care about their actual newer things right maybe some pie and moss stuff does well but no one cares about Reebok outside of the Reebok classic especially in the terms of a cultural sense of things right in terms of the streetwear type people they don't care about anything else apart from classics or the C clubs or whatever they may be but it feels like I feel like they didn't make enough effort to really go aggressive and bring new shit to the table something fresh challenge the consumer they just kept presenting the same shit and expecting different results but it feels like converse do do a good job of it through you know obviously this collaboration with the cold wall the collab they do with flipping what's his face with them tyler the creator with golf they have models that they kind of try and push here and there to kind of mix things up make stuff more interesting and i think it kind of pays dividends in the long run because i'd imagine i uh, do, you, do you think all this up apparel is converse too but yeah, look, you would never guess that was a fucking commerce if you saw that. So cool, man. Great shoot as well, as per usual. There's always some great architectural tie-ins and just, you know, interesting stories being told and imagery being put out and whatnot. Like, that looks so bad. So good. Look at that. Ay, 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 ay. Fire, fire, fire. Such a cool model, man. Like, it legitimately looks like nothing out there on the market at the moment. Apart from maybe, what's that Nike that I'm thinking of with the greenish sort of midsole? What am I thinking of? Is that that basketball shoe? 
Oh, there's a, there's a Nike I'm thinking that maybe similar on the midsole, but in terms of how the uppers put together, um, even the outsole, it's really fresh looking, really really fresh looking. That like we can't say it isn't. Absolutely looks fantastic. Let's go to the article. It says following initial um, teaser images revealed last month, release dates for the Cold War Aeon Active Converse sneakers have now been officially put out. The duo first joined forces back in 2020 with a Chuck Taylor. That was really nice, actually, the Chuck Taylor. This time around, the Converse and Sammy Ross debut, a futuristic lifestyle runner, applying Sammy Ross's signature aesthetic and Converse innovative CX comfort technology. Um, the laser sneaker arrives in aesthetic stretch. Sorry, it arrives in an elastic stretch, um, and combo mesh uppers with seasonal codes printed across the laterals, branded pull tabs on the tongue and the heel, and a thick crater foam midsole that mimic the texture of the concrete. A exaggerated heel kick and a TPU heel wedge below allow for seamless off and on wear. The semi translucent outsole complete the design. Two iterations will be available from April twelfth. Um, oh sorry the one's coming out April 6th it's already come out and then the other one uh, what sorry, Cold Wars website April 6th and Converse April 12th bruv don't go too far and then another one coming out April, May 12th but yeah they look fucking banging man actually I can say I'm interested to see I guess we'll find out later if he actually designed them for the ground up if there's something that they just designed already and he kind of stuffed his colorway or his application on top of them but regardless man this is an absolutely banging shoe I'm not gonna lie it's fucking sick. I'm a really big fan of it. This is what I want to see from fashion designers or fashion brands when they're collaborating with sneaker companies. Come with something fresh. Don't just get an Air Force One and change the colors. Like, come with something fresh. Even the Air Force One he did. Remember that one back in the day with the two, two with the only two eyelet holes and whatnot. Like that just looked mad. Do you know what I mean? At least it's something interesting, something fresh, something new pose a different question challenging the consumer somewhat and also if anything it's an actual representation of what the brand's about so if you buy that a cold war air force one and you buy into that you're most likely going to buy into the rest of the brand because it kind of you know it has um the same codes as the actual brand does right really really cool i'm a big fan of it so yeah big up big up big up move on from that one we have this which is a slight again only a pet peeve from me because i'm an absolute dodo but this is courtesy of a twitter account called modern notoriety and it features um a couple of kids basically dropping off a friends and family box of these union air jordan 2 rattans and i don't know I've always hated this sort of shit personally, maybe being a lifelong sneakerhead. I feel like friends and family pairs should be made available for consumers, especially nowadays, because I feel like the friends and family who from for me, I've been buying shoes for two decades, right? Plus. And I generally think everyone who gets friends and family now are the same people I saw get friends and family when I used to post on Crooked Tongues back in the day. It hasn't changed. It's the same old tired faces. And then maybe there might be some new people here and there. But for the most part, it's the same tired old people posting pictures of their thank you notes, posting pictures and tagging the companies. Thank you. Thank you. It's like nonsense. Right. And I feel like for me, considering how popular sneakers have become, considering it's a multi-billion dollar industry, considering that everyone and their mum knows about limited edition shoes, it would be cool for the brands as a weird sort of like olive branch and a weird way to kind of feel pe make people feel like they're involved and they're part of it and whatnot. To have a way where fans or customers, regular customers like you and I, can be able, again, this is naff as hell, and no one needs this, but it, sh it would be cool if you were able to purchase these friends and family box and have it come in a flipping um what you call it in a what, what do you call these things i don't even know what they are because i don't own one but whatever that freaking thing is where you have fishes in it and shit right that'd be pretty cool to see if that was the case like that would be nice like why can't fans have this why is it only limited to friends and family and again friends and family who for the most part i won't say not appreciate it but this is every when i used to work in a sneaker store I used to be around people that worked in streetwear stores or whatnot. 
this is an everyday occurrence. Someone's always sending you something cool because they want to get next to you because you're clouded up because it's just a cool look to have your thing in their store. This is an everyday occurrence. And most of this stuff ends up in the stock room <coughs> after a period of time, maybe manager nicks it and takes it home. You know who you are, right? This happens on a constant basis. So these are, this is nothing new or fresh. This is like, it lasts for like a week in terms of an, bit of content that's online and then after it disappears in terms of actual real life practicality but if this was given to an actual customer they're actually going to appreciate it they're going to be like oh sick i've got this really cool amazing thing that i, I would never be able to get again it might be the once in a large opportunity to have a friends and family box type thing in your house and it might actually form a centerpiece of your home whatever Jimmy, you're gonna value this far more than the owner of some you know store somewhere in the middle of paris or some you know washed up flipping friends and family guy who's getting another free box because he happens to be you know grandfathered 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 into the seeding program somewhere hey does it sound like a bit of hate coming from me maybe maybe i'm not denying it but for the most part i just feel like it would be cool to just see customers have the ability to purchase friends and family boxes and promo material and whatnot when it comes to these sneaker releases they they release them often enough anyway it's not even as if like this is special there's always a there's always a release it feels like every other month that's got a friends and family sort of version next to it but for the whatever reason no one else can pay it like get it like all you the only thing you can see is just you can get subjected to these videos you can see a picture of Ata Abari wearing him terribly in some horrible outfit oh, yeah I mean that's that's basically what you have to basically subject yourself to it's just I feel like a little bit out of order in my opinion but maybe I'm looking at it all wrong and you know this is kind of part and parcel of the game at the moment I don't really know but the shoe itself is fucking fantastic I've mentioned it plenty of times on here I think um R.I.P. the go um Virgil Abloh but I think he played a huge part in terms of I feel like reintroducing the Air Jordan 2 to the cultural zeitgeist because I wasn't paying any attention to that shoe whatsoever before I saw those Air Jordan 2's lows that um, Virgil did with Off-White that were really successful actually oddly enough that sold out you know all over the place and if anything it's another weird one from the Virgil Abloh sort of Nike collab thing that I see more people wearing than I see reselling which is again kind of um i feel like a good little seal of approval for you as a designer to have people kind of wearing your really limited edition shoe that they know they can make a bag off of but they'd rather wear it because it's that good do you know what i mean it kind of puts you in the conundrum or the kind of shoe that you'd want to get doubles off so you can wear one and keep one or wear one and flip one whatever but um off the back of that now we've got these um jordan 2 comes out courtesy of union there's another colorway too i think it's like a bluishy kind of color um but they're both banging i'd wear the head out of both i'm sure again i've never actually owned a pair of jordan 2s because my favorites i've always said are jordan what no in in order jordan 4s jordan 6s jordan 1s jordan 7s Jordan 3s those are probably in order of my Jordans that I like but I've never ever worn a Jordan 2 I might have even worn a, an 11 before but I've never worn a 2 so if that's the case I'm sure these will probably end up looking far worse on my feet than they do in you know on these product shots because these product shots are fucking fantastic they make them look really fresh but I like them in terms of the colorway um in terms of the material choices like it just looks really cool like it really really does look really fresh i'm a big big fan of it um but yeah um let's quickly play this video a little promotion video here what this is saying there's no sound of music on it what am i bugging okay no mind the sound of music you can chill but whatever um yeah they used to come out april 15th for 225 dollars anyway you won't be able to get the flipping um um what you call it uh friends and family box unfortunately you just gonna have to wait you just have to see people getting these cool boxes you know the same people you see getting these boxes every single fucking year but hey ho what can we do let's move on from that and let's what's i talking about here mm, bear with me a second what's i talking about here just all like this Yes, guys, quickly. Uh, yeah, so by this quickly. So, <clears throat> I'm not too sure if most of you guys are aware, but there was a madness going on 
Twitter the last couple of days or whatnot. Um, it felt like a battle of the sexes, out of the blue, out of nowhere. Um, I didn't really understand what the deal was. And I kind of had to go back in time and sort of kind of piece things together. And it kind of made me really question my place in humanity and really question why we are here and if we're ever going to recover from this pandemic. Because it feels like to me, this is another weird consequence of the pandemic. The fact that we are caring about such trivial matters, firstly, and the fact that we've somehow be got ourselves in the position where we sit on Twitter spaces arguing amongst each other about issues that for the large for the most part um don't necessarily concern us or don't impact us in any sort of way. Then when actual serious allegations get put forward and actual painful stories get shared, the victims have like minimal time to share the you know, to basically talk about their experiences or to be you know maybe points of contact for other people and it then kind of spins back into the people who want to cause a drama now if you're wondering what the fuck you're talking about i guess you know i'll try and piece it together for you so it feels like to me this started oddly enough with this random post this is courtesy of the shade borough and this young lady is married to this mc or this rapper called crept who's from a group called crept and conan um she randomly, I don't know why, don't ask me why, but she randomly posted something on a Snapchat that said the follows. It said, one, we co-parent. Oh no, sorry. Someone asked her a question, it looks like, right? Why is your baby father making you go halves on a childcare, right? Um, no, okay, cool. I'm, I'm messing it up. Basically, there was a post that this lady put up, who's the baby mother, who was in a relationship with this rapper. They have a kid, they split up. She posted, I think, something on her Snapchat, like, you know, what people do because it's social media. She was basically complaining aloud about spending money and about struggling as a mom and whatnot, whatever it may be. Innocent sort of thing she put out there. For whatever reason, people latched onto the thing that she said that her and the father split the kind of nursery cost half and half. And then I guess as well, the number of the nursery costs or the nursery fee was really high and people were surprised, I guess, because, you know, I guess the majority of people out there maybe don't have kids or don't know how much nurseries actually cost, so they're kind of taken back by the figure. Then she comes out and replies with this, because I guess somebody asked her, why are you going halves? And she kind of listed why, right? <clears throat> Which is crazy to think how you explain your parenting to people online. But anyway, here's where we are. She was like, as follows, we co-parent. Number two, he helped me be in a position I am, even, <clears throat> even be able to, um, <clears throat> sorry about that, to pay for those fees and manage number three he's done and still does he, he's done and still is doing a lot more than a lot of these men are here for he has set up nana for life <clears throat> um and then lastly <clears throat> don't try it please having a child with somebody does not mean they must pay for everything she's my child too so a pretty reasonable adult grown-up sort of reply which is something you don't really see too often on social media and i thought that was kind of over with but for whatever reason this sort of sparked a reaction with people on twitter and now twitter specifically twitter spaces has turned into the new clubhouse it feels like um a lot of people go on there and especially for myself being a fan of kind of football and whatnot and following united it's always good to go in there and speak to fellow fans and rant about the game and whatnot but there's a kind of another part of it where people go in there and you know do singing competitions and whatnot talk about music talk about life culture whatever it may be and this one space popped up which is hashtag talks with ash where the title of the space was should crep pay all the nursery fees and it had i don't know let's say over 100 people in there basically going back and forth as to whether arguing about somebody else's child fee arrangements or you know nursery arrangements it just it was mad just as a kind of thing to kind of observe from afar but again it's woman's business not my business this is probably something more poignant to them because they're probably things that they speak about anyway in terms of their own little social groups so that makes complete sense that's cool for, for now right but for whatever reason this one conversation i feel like then spiraled into people sharing their abuse stories specifically sexual abuse stories really crazy ones right i'm not going to go into much detail about them but a couple of the ladies basically accused god's gift the mc and this producer guy called uh, five beats of basically being abusers so really heinous accusations that are being levied against these kind of guys are like heavy heavy things but it came off the back of this conversation somehow and off the back of that conversation 
or these abusers coming forward, they decided to go and share their story. I think one of the ladies decided to go on harsh reality gnosis with the host as who, you know, is a bit of a controversial figure here in the UK who divides opinion. And for the most part, it feels like people on social media don't necessarily like how he conducts himself. And if you're talking about optics to go from interviewing Octavian on one space and essentially playing the, Oh, I'm going to see two sides of the story. He wants to share his point of view. He wants to speak to the people. And then to go from being that guy to suddenly switching and trying to be the advocate for women, it just didn't hit home. And it felt like the women kind of sniffed, you know, smelt, you know, sniffed it out and were able to tell. And again, I like the as guy, but it was a little bit of a clout chase, <coughs> not a little bit. It was a clout chase. And, it really ended up kind of exploding in his face to the point where this as guy ends up having a real big beef with this lady ashley or ash lauren or something i don't forgive me i don't know her whole name I and mean, i think it might be ashley actually i think i follow i think her name is ashley they end up having a beef they end up arguing it ends up then you know erupting into then kind of spiraling into uh people accusing chronic the mc of getting into some passa that ends up getting involved with wiley's little brother i didn't even know if wiley had a fucking little brother just some absolute madness but the point of this whole story to say is that for the most part it feels like to me the conclusion from all of this is number one men in no way men under no circumstances should ever lead conversations that involve sexual abuse or sexual assault or whatever underneath that umbrella they should be nowhere near leading them they should they can contribute they can maybe add opinions or whatnot but in terms of leading a conversation on how to combat or how to deal with or how to talk about sexual assault sexual abuse nowhere near it because for whatever reason we don't have the ability to articulate ourselves in a way where it can make sense or it doesn't come off as dismissive or lacking understanding or compassion because it felt like to me again i'm no one but from the outside looking in even the guys that were attempting to try to be somewhat of an ally they were slipping up somewhere or the other they were just fumbling their words not really saying and i felt like for me it was just most of, okay this is definitely a thing where because it doesn't necessarily impact men as much don't get me wrong men do suffer from sexual abuse and sexual assault for sure and rape and whatnot true but it's definitely an issue that impacts women more so they probably have a better way of articulating themselves when it comes to explaining it then the other thing i thought of as well which is might sound callous but i generally do think it's probably it's probably it's probably um counterproductive to share stories of sexual abuse or sexual assault on social media first especially before you've gone through the necessary legal you know whatever police channels whatnot it definitely doesn't serve any purpose because i feel like a lot of the confusion or the anger from the guys came because for whatever reason when the five beats guy was getting accused of what he was getting accused of or when the god's gift was getting accused of chronic name just came out in the blue or i remember or maybe some girl i forgot where it was no who the, how'd it go basically some sort of chaos erupted off of the back of those two guys names getting mentioned and it felt like his name just got thrown in there out of the blue out of nowhere maybe there was a reason for it i don't really understand but then he started going off started to threaten people he started to threaten you know, telling people he's going to meet them in east london he's going to shoot them in the face like crazy shit right and a lot of it i feel like came to because everyone was really amped up and sensitive and worried about getting exposed i don't know whatever maybe oh yeah that's what i was gonna say thirdly i feel like again this is a weird reaction to say i don't know any of these people but this is just an observation from the outside in a lot of the guys i felt like who had really strong reactions who are really kind of barking and ranting and shouting i feel like a lot of those guys were reacting that way subconsciously or unconsciously because a lot of them have their own skeletons in the closet that they were afraid were also going to get exposed because it didn't make no sense why some of them were getting really agitated and angry it's like if you're not an abuser or an assaulter why are you why is it kind of touching your balls so much that girls are saying all men or this that or whatever generalizations like why does it worry you if it's not you it shouldn't matter but for whatever reason people's emotions were so high on those twitter spaces that people were really 
falling out of each other in a big way arguing all night like, i think i stayed up until like three listening to one space like people were going even today people were still talking about it like this guy as is going to do his space on sunday talking about it. it's just like wow 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 like it really is a lot and i said before that i think a lot of it has to do with the pandemic you know maybe because you know the pandemic was such a bleak time seeing all those fucking numbers going up every single day of random people across the world dying you know those morgues where you know that would overflow and the people's bodies were getting piled up the massacre that happened in italy remember when the covid ripped through italy like there was so much bleak stuff going on that i feel like sometimes when a gossipy type topic comes to the timeline people latch onto it because it helps you kind of get distracted from the horrors of everyday life even though don't get me wrong sexual assault isn't like some sort of like happy wappy subject to kind of divert yourself away from the horrors of everyday life but you're far more inclined to sit there and be willing to speak about you know crept and conan's sorry crept's you know nursery fee situations with his baby mother you're more willing to do that than to flip in you know go through the horrors that happened in that city in ukraine recently right is it buka or bucha right you'd much rather speak about these and then ukraine i definitely understand but god almighty man one absolute shit show like absolute shit show no one came out of that looking good and again the horrifying part of it was that the actual victims two of the ladies that came forward probably had the least to say out of this whole situation for so what it's been what four days or so i think these guys have been going back and forth and for the most part those two girls have basically spoken the least out of anyone and now it's turned into a thing where this Ashley girl is beef with the ass guy. It's just like, what the fuck is going on here? And it maybe is expose, exposes human nature. Because what it maybe is, again, is a reminder that at the heart of it, no one really cares. Everyone's in it for themselves, for the most part. So even though they're kind of pretending like they're about the victims, they pretend they want to give you a platform, really, it's maybe an opportunity to kind of further their voice to maybe you know put themselves front and center of the situation help them kind of dictate the narrative so it kind of comes back to them and ultimately in your deepest on your deep darkest sort of moments there will be nowhere to be found do you know what i mean that's the really sad thing about it but on the flip side of things too i'm sure both of those ladies or the victims or whatever they've gone through the necessary um, procedures in terms of going to court or reporting to the police and most likely that hasn't gone anywhere either so imagine how hopeless you're going to feel as a victim of sexual abuse you go through something really heinous especially in a very um i would say in a scene or in a community of people who you feel like won't necessarily be receptive to your allegations you pluck up the courage to maybe then say it aloud so that maybe you can release yourself from the trauma or from the pain or to maybe in a roundabout way get some sort of um payback you know on the person that did it to you so if you can't get them in the courts maybe say you know i'm gonna ruin your public your reputation in public that might give you some sort of sense of kind of satisfaction then it turns into the people who you try to you know get on their platform because they've got the largest voices or largest people maybe tuning into it they didn't end up turning a situation where it was more about them than it is about you imagine how that must feel crazy like i honestly couldn't believe my ears some of the things i was listening to in those spaces like it was just absolutely insane and again the victims were just forgotten about i'm not even sure people can actually even name who the victims are or who they accused or who their accusers were jamie it's just fucking nuts really really fucking nuts um but yeah like i said my one conclusion from this is that for the most part <clears throat> men should be nowhere near sexual abuse or sexual assault topics at all zero and i think as played as really kind of shot himself in the foot with this whole octavian thing and then bouncing onto this and not have it's just i don't know i, I don't even think he shot himself in the foot let me just take that back i think he knew exactly what he was doing and this has always been part of his plan do you know what i mean to basically put him in a position where he's able to kind of you know clout up in some sort of roundabout way um and for the most part it's working because you know let's be honest in a, in a few months time most likely he's going to have a show somewhere he's going to have he's going to be on some sort of platform you know it's going to happen you know what i mean because he does command people's attention for whatever reason people seem to be really even the ones that don't like him seem to can't they see they, they they have the inability to sort of like turn away and um 
maybe this says a lot more about us as people in it than it does about him who knows who bloody knows but yeah one absolute shit show one absolute shit show anyway that is the excellent thing show episode number five six eight i'm gonna stop for now because i've been rambling over too long if you've enjoyed the show so far thank you and um sorry for the you know radio silence but i hope you understand my reasons and now my nose is flaring up again maybe you can be more understanding of it um but yeah hopefully you enjoy the show um let me know if you didn't or don't actually let me know no let me know if you didn't why not let me know if you did enjoy the show <laughs> i appreciate all feedback um as per usual links to all my socials and whatnot can be found in the description support the show via patreon of course i haven't done a patreon episode in ages but if you want to subscribe to the patreon you're more than welcome to it's only a dollar um to subscribe on the equivalent of one pound you get a bonus show usually every month or sorry every week you're meant to get a bonus show but of course i've been slacking because i've been away for time but jump on there anyway it's gonna be a new show coming at the end of the week so if you want a new show on patreon bonus only definitely jump on there um and if you also have to promote do, 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 nothing really that's about it really but yeah contacts and list all that in the description and yeah you know rate the show on spotify if you can if you want to if you don't i don't mind um and if you listen to us via the audio you hear us nice tune of the week or tune of the day actually i'm going to tell you what it is if you listen to what, watching the audio so you can maybe listen to it oh, i'm going to put it on the youtube <clears throat> so my tune of the day <clears throat> Um, on the audio podcast, <coughs> bloody hell, my voice is fucked up with this hay fever. It's gonna be yeah. Let's let's play this. The new tune, of the, the the tune of the week. Sorry, or tune of the day. Yeah, no, so tune of the day on this podcast will be Pusha T's Neck and Wrist featuring Jay Z. So if you listen to the audio podcast, you hear that play. And if you're watching the audio, the video, unfortunately, you won't hear nothing play, and you'll see me again very very soon. So take care, my friends. Take care.